relation between major powers, between the United States, China, and Russia. Um, the Trump administration, uh, despite what uh, President Trump has said about Russia, um, made quite clear in its national security strategy that the administration at least formally concurs with that assessment. Um, uh, and so the question is, what does that mean concretely for uh, the liberal order? What does that mean concretely for the United States and our friends and allies around the world? And uh, so I thought I'd just offer a few thoughts on what that might mean in Asia in light of what we've seen coming out of Beijing uh, over the last several years, and particularly under President Xi. Uh, but first, I just want to say on the question of the liberal international order, I mean, we all could debate here, and I'm sure you all have in your, in your seminars leading up to this event, until we're blue in the face, what the order is, right? Uh, uh, and there's also a lot of whataboutism about the order. Well, you know, did the United States really, um, you know, co uh, fulfill its obligations and, un uh, uh, and under every, you know, every liberal tenet? Um, was it always the exemplar in promoting democracy and did it never subvert it? And the answer, of course, to that is no. Uh, uh, you know, we, we have plenty of examples of the United States, even in the post-war era, operating particularly in Latin America, let's say, or in Iran, uh, in ways that are not consistent with the uh, with with the principles that uh, uh, you know that this order is supposed to enshrine, and so um, uh, I think we just accept that and we move on. But that doesn't mean that there's no such thing as an order. Uh, and I think what we have the question we have to ask ourselves is uh, if we look where we're headed, uh, if we look at China's behavior in East Asia. Um, are we going to be headed toward an order that is simply a lot less liberal and ultimately one that's a lot less ordered? And that's where I think uh, we could be headed uh, unless we see strong American commitment and strong uh, allied commitment uh, in, in, in the region to resist uh, what China sees as uh, in its inevitable march toward regaining what I think is an imagined history of uh, dominance in the region. Um, so, so uh, you know, I think we can look at this uh, from a security perspective. We can look at it from uh, an economic perspective and a political perspective, uh, acknowledging that in many ways these domains blur uh, and uh, China and Russia uh, intentionally blur them uh, uh, to uh, make their challenge uh, to the order uh, more complex uh, and harder to uh, resist in many ways. Uh, so, you know, let's just start with, uh, on the security front, what has China said? You know, well, President Xi has said uh, he's called for a new Asian security architecture. Uh, senior, uh, senior Chinese officials um, have said that the U.S. alliance system in Asia is essentially atavistic. Um, uh, uh, Fu Ying, who uh, is the chairperson of the National People's Congress Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, wrote a piece saying, the U.S.-led world order is a suit that no longer fits, right? So it's pretty clear uh, on the record. Um, and I won't go into a lot of what's happening in the South China Sea and East China Sea in detail here because you, that, that's probably the part of the picture that many of you are most familiar with. But it boils down to very incremental efforts, um, uh, uh, often using Coast Guard ships, fishermen uh, uh, in, in the area, coordinated, however, by the government. Uh, in many ways, what a colleague of mine uh, at Brookings calls all measures short of war, uh, to revise the status quo uh, and to do it just below the threshold that would provoke U.S. military engagement. Uh, but to keep doing it such that uh, over time uh, it forces our allies to question whether the United States remains a credible ally uh, in the region and whether they have to compromise uh, their uh, alliance in order to gain the dividends from economic and political cooperation with uh, China. We can talk a little bit more about that strategy later. I think the part of the picture that we're beginning to see much more recently in starker relief, um, and that there's a lot more discussion about now in Washington as there should be, is on the economic front and when it comes to political coercion or political influence campaign. So on the economic front, I'll just give you some examples of what we're beginning to see and what I think we'll, we'll see more of. Um, in 2017, when uh, South Korea chose uh, uh, to take from the United States um, uh, what's called the THAAD missile, de missile defense system, um, theater high altitude uh, uh, d uh, d defense, 
Um, the Chinese uh, government responded, uh, as many of you know, by um, uh, by punishing a uh, uh, lot this Japanese uh, uh, Korean conglomerate uh, by closing 80% of its supermarkets. Uh, China and then punishing other Korean businesses as well, um, and then uh, basically engaging in sa state sanctioned boycotts of Korean goods. Um, in the context of China's One Belt, One Road initiative, which in many, in many ways could be very good for the region, uh, we've seen coercive effects in Sri Lanka, just for example, uh, where there are credible allegations that the former president of Sri Lanka was bribed uh, in order to uh, convince him to take a, a deal um, uh, with a Sri Lankan port. Uh, ultimately, that deal was not sustainable for the government and has been converted now into a 99-year lease by the Chinese government uh, on that port in Sri Lanka. Uh, if you, uh, uh, 2016, Mongolia hosted the Dalai Lama. Um, in response, China froze diplomatic relations. It froze discussions over an important loan discussion they were having and imposed commodity tariffs. Uh, and we go back to 2009 even. Uh, some of you will call there was a collision between a Chinese and Japanese ship. And as a result, China imposed an embargo uh, for uh, rare earths, which are critical to many Japanese industries. Uh, it extends to Europe. Uh, if you look at Norway, right, when the Nobel Prize was awarded to the human rights activist Liu Xiaobo, in response, China uh, froze all diplomatic relations for years mm -hmm. and cut off uh, ties with Norway's fisheries industry, which is important to it economically. And then quite recently, just this year, um, you've seen in response to the companies Daimler and Marriott, you know, uh, uh, having references or quotes uh, to the Dalai Lama not intended to be politically charged in one way, in any way, um, causing serious offense and requiring apologies lest their operations be shut down uh, in China. So. Uh, there are many more examples of that, but these are the kinds of mercantilist economic policies um, that we're seeing. I think this is a small picture. I think many, much of what's happening in Southeast Asia is actually not transparent. We don't know. Uh, it probably runs much deeper uh, than this, especially when it comes to Laos and Cambodia and Thailand. Um, on, the, on the political front, um, there's been a lot of news lately in Australia and New Zealand about Chinese political influence campaigns. It turned out that the largest donor to political campaigns in Australia was a relatively unknown Chinese businessman who's a land developer. Uh, Australia did not really have particularly robust campaign finance laws, uh, but now Australia is beginning to unravel that it's actually much more complicated, that there were Chinese efforts to compromise Australian journalists, uh, 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 Australian higher education, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, in Canada, there were reports that there were provincial officials who were Chinese intelligence operatives. In Germany, we know that a member of the Bundestag, who was the chair of the Human Rights Committee, was told he would never be allowed to ch travel to China if he, unless he stopped saying certain things on social media or and in speeches. Um, this is an elected official in Germany. Uh, uh, keep in mind. And then in academia, there has been controversy where uh, uh, Cambridge University Press um, decided it would censor itself and then reversed itself under pressure from a lot of academics publishing with them. Springer, Nature, um, uh, the list can go on. We've seen harassment of the families of Chinese students studying abroad uh, who have been critical uh, of the Chinese government. Uh, and that's in the West. So, so um, imagine uh, you could see a lot more of that uh, in uh, the region. So, so uh, where does all this um, take us? Well, I, look, I, I think um, you know, for anyone who studied history, this kind of behavior should be very familiar. This is generally how things have been done, uh, arguably. And uh, the real question, you know, as one of my colleagues has said, is whether we want to try to maintain this little garden that we've carved out in the jungle. And my, my, my colleague Bob Kagan is coming out with a book shortly called The Jungle Grows Back, um, uh, which is a great title for a book. Uh, and you know, the argument is that the liberal order has, uh, you know, uh, as, as the, what we're talking about now and what's being compromised now is a relatively new thing, uh, arguably. It's uh, what we worry about now is something that arguably wasn't really uh, 
implemented, taken seriously, um, uh, except in the last you know, 25, 30 years. Uh, yes, we've had the invasion of Iraq, and we could go down this, and I, I suspect we'll discuss some of the, some of those issues. Uh, but even in, in but in case in, in other cases like humanitarian intervention, as you all have discussed, there 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 was a set of principles behind those. The rules were not necessarily agreed upon, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, but that's really uh, the question. Uh, I don't think this should become a debate about uh, whether there really is has been any kind of order uh, at all. Uh, now, look, is is the United States an exemplar of democratic governance right now? Well, uh, uh, the one thing I would say on that question is it's important to look at what's happening institutionally in the United States right now. Um, you do see the press pushing back against the liberal te tendencies. You see the courts pushing back against these tendencies. You see the institutions of the government, uh, not, I believe, in the sense of double government that really believes it has owes nothing to, uh, to the citizens of the United States, but in the sense of pushing back uh, to protect liberal values enshrined in the Constitution. Uh, and that's a story that I think we need to tell more uh, to our friends and allies. Uh, they may recognize themselves a bit more in us right now than they ever have before as they see some of these battles uh, uh, play out. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, Mr. Chabra. Um, up next we have um, Professor Wojtolowski. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad to be here again. Uh, it's not uh, my first time to bear the Apex Symposium. Three years ago I was uh, at this symposium devoted to Russia and Russia's role in the world. Uh, I'm very grateful for inviting me, and uh, it, it, it's a great conference, and uh, I, I want to express my <coughs> gratitude towards uh, people who have organized it and invested their efforts, thoughts, and uh, ideas to this conference. Concerning the topic of uh, this discussion, I would like to uh, focus on two perspectives, on historic perspective and on political and ideological perspective. Because to my mind, the concept of liberal, liberal world order in general uh, is uh, a little bit more than concept, but it's a concept. The paradox of uh, um, uh, its development since it uh, has appeared in the end of 19th century uh, that uh, from that point, uh, this concept of liberal world order has been moving to, uh, towards becoming a reality, a political reality of international relations. But on the one hand, the concept is still the concept, and it is very far from the current reality of the international system. Uh, the idea uh, of a liberal world order uh, appeared in uh, some works of uh, people who called themselves world, federalist, world federalists uh, in the end and in the, of the 19th century and in the beginning of 20th century. And uh, for the first time, uh, it has uh, appeared as an attempt to apply it in, a, in an international system in the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson. But uh, in that time, it was absolutely not matching the reality of great power competition of European empires, and uh, that's why uh, all uh, other participants uh, of uh, the international system uh, perceived this uh, idea uh, you know, as, a, as a strange uh, concept appearing from far distant land of the United States. But uh, uh, in that time, especially with uh, these 14 points of uh, President Woodrow Wilson, uh, the narrative of international relations has been changed. And uh, it was dramatic change, uh, and uh, since that time, uh, the concept of uh, liberal world order uh, developed uh, in, in an ambivalent way. On the one hand, it was concept based, uh, based on the belief that uh, world uh, system, the international system, can consist of uh, mostly democracies respecting the same principles of uh, uh, you know, market economy, uh, liberal democracy, in its Western and especially American understanding. On the other hand, uh, it has been based on the idea that uh, international system uh, 
can uh, be an analogy of uh, the system of uh, of the political system of uh, the state based on liberal democratic principles. And this combination has been developing uh, simultaneously during uh, the whole period of uh, development of this concept and uh, during uh, all attempts to uh, apply it as a political background for changes in the, in the international system. What has been prevailing? I think that the second part has been prevailing until uh, 1990s, because if we will look attentively, uh, for example, to the document which uh, uh, Ambassador Rock uh, mentioned yesterday, the Atlantic Charter of 1943, uh, we will find that it has been signed not only by Theodore, uh, uh, sorry, but not only by Franklin Delano Roosevelt and uh, Winston Churchill. It has been signed, by, uh, signed and supported by Soviet Union by uh, Deputy Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs of the Soviet Union, Ivan Maisky, who has signed it and supported it, and Atlantic Charter, which has become the background for both the United Nations and NATO, has been a document which has been supported by all members of anti-Hitler anti coalition. But what has happened? On the one hand, the UN system has been influenced, uh, the emergence of UN system, as the system of international institutions based on the rule of law and the principles of uh, uh, global governance in that, uh, in understanding of that time, uh, appeared uh, as a universal, you know, uh, body which uh, could, could be, but never been, uh, could be uh, the managing uh, body of uh, the global governance system which could uh, resolve uh, disputes between states and can be used as a uh, decision-making body. But what it uh, really has become during the Cold War, it has become the playground of political talks and it has become uh, the only you know, anchor to, uh, uh, for the dialogue uh, between uh, the United States and Soviet Union between two systems, socialist camp and uh, capitalist system, about uh, the uh, division of spheres of influence, about uh, principles of uh, behavior, and uh, about some issues which uh, have been uh, you know, significant for both sides and cannot be resolved on a bilateral level, but uh, um, the institution of uh, UN Security Council uh, provided the illusion that uh, and uh, sometimes a real instrument to resolve some, uh, you know, controversial uh, questions uh, and problems and to build uh, some, uh, some agenda together. But uh, what happened after uh, uh, the end of the Cold War? The emerging uh, international system has been described by many authors, not only by Francis Fukuyama, but many Western authors, uh, as uh, the system which is going to be uh, much closer to the standards of uh, um, you know, liberal world order. But what has happened in the reality? In the reality, it, it was a system combining uh, you know, principles on which um, uh, the, the United Nations and previous world order uh, has been based. But on the other hand, it, uh, it combines some elements on which uh, the Euro-Atlantic security community has been based. And these principles was, were principles uh, which uh, have been aimed to, uh, uh, to give you know, ideological and political background for the group of allies. But this group of allies has become, you know, uh, this, uh, the, the group of uh, uh, specials in, uh, in terms of hierarchy of the international system after the end of the Cold War. But what, what uh, was uh, different from the real liberal world order? The difference was that uh, international institutions uh, even sometimes becoming uh, more developed, they uh, have become uh, not stronger. Uh, the principles of uh, sovereignty, the principles of international law, which also have been developing, uh, were uh, used in a practical way in, uh, you know, in different uh, in, uh, spheres, uh, in, uh, but on, based on different models of understanding uh, 
of uh, uh, their usage and uh, their goals. And uh, what, what really also happened? Did uh, this uh, community of democracies emerged? I think no. Unfortunately, no, or uh, thanks God, no. I, I, I do not have a position about this. But uh, what I see is the group of allies uh, led by the United States and uh, followed by Western uh, democracies has followed by many countries which uh, were imitating democracy as the model of their uh, development, economic and political. Uh, some of them even were not imitating democracy. For example, uh, do you see uh, Saudi Arabia or Pakistan or Afghanistan, uh, which are major allies uh, of the United States outside of NATO democracies? That's the paradox. But uh, they are members of international community, respected members, sovereign states, and they are also participants of this uh, development of the world order uh, who are on the Western side of understanding of uh, the model of uh, the world order. But what has happened to uh, the international law, for example? Uh, uh, we have several examples of development of uh, the global uh, of elements of global law, not international, but global law. For example, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. But we see that the United States, who were leading the process of development of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, they're not members of the convention. Chinese, China, is a member of the convention, but it doesn't follow uh, the recommendations and uh, the rules of this convention. And it's, it's a paradox when uh, we have existing norms, we have existing uh, institutions, we have principles. Some of them are reminding principles of liberal world order, but they're not functioning. So is it the real world, a liberal world order, or it's another system in which we can find elements of, uh, political, of different political systems, we, in which we can find different uh, institutions, uh, different understandings of norms and different understandings of uh, even law. But uh, to which extent it can become liberal world order? I'm very skeptical about it. I think that major powers are still major powers and they will be major powers. But what is moving us towards uh, the world order which could be based more on uh, regulatory principles uh, on uh, the rule of law, I mean international law. I mean, I think it's economy. Because economy is driving us uh, towards globalization, towards more interdependent and more interconnected world. But will this interdependence change competitiveness? I think no. I think that competitiveness in this uh, international system is growing together with uh, interdependence. And this is the world we are entering. And in this world, we have to find some, you know, backgrounds for uh, keeping this system stable and not uh, get it into the, you know, uh, major power competition in the understanding uh, of 19th century and the beginning of 20th century, not, uh, to avoid war. But what is stabilizing this system? What is making really uh, stable and safe and more secure? I think it's nuclear weapons. Because uh, until, we, until major powers are having nuclear weapons, this world can be more predictable, more rational, and more stable. And everybody are understanding you know, the risks and stakes they are having in this uh, uh, system. So on the one hand, economic interdependence are, is getting us closer to, uh, to, to each other and, may, and forcing us to uh, negotiate about some rules on the other hand, uh, the, the military power and especially uh, nuclear weapons are forcing us to be more cautious in our uh, steps in, in terms of use of force, in terms of violation of, so, of sovereignty, in terms of uh, you know, competitiveness uh, among great powers. So we're entering into something else. And to which extent the ideas of institutionalism multilateralism and uh, uh, the rule of law 
will be, uh, you know, used and popular and, uh, you know, applicable in this world. Uh, to that extent, uh, this system will be stable and predictable, and uh, the, the risks in, uh, in this system uh, could be reduced. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wojtolowski. And finally, we have um, Professor Knight. Thank you very much. Again, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to this wonderful symposium. And I have to say I've, I've, been, I've enjoyed every moment of it, and especially the young people, the, the, the students who uh, seem very enthusiastic and, and, and very articulate in terms of getting your points across and questions that you ask and so on. So I, I really appreciate uh, being with you. Um, what I'm going to try to do, and since I, I was one of the, the last minute additions to this panel, I had no idea I was going to be on it until uh, last night. Um, and then I, I told myself I was going to go home after a very long day yesterday and, uh, and write a, maybe write a few thoughts down, uh, maybe do a few, little bit of reading, and then discovered at the Hyatt that um, the electricity was off uh, <laughs> for the entire night until this morning at 7 o'clock. So I have no, had no time to prepare anything for this, so um, I'm going to have to wing it. <laughs> but I, I thought that... Um, <coughs> It'd be, it'd be useful to sort of offer some perspective. After listening to the, our panelists, I think they were very good in terms of pre presenting their position on uh, the, the, the sort of different types of governance systems uh, that poses a challenge to the liberal order that we've come to know since 1945, essentially. Um, uh, so I really appreciate what you, have had to, what you had to say. But I thought I'd give you some sort of historical perspective as well. And, um, as some context as to why this is happening. Because I think it's important to, to, to understand why it is that we are developing new forms of governance in opposition to what we've come to believe as, uh, especially in the West, as being um, accepted norm uh, and a movement towards a new norm of, um, of, of, of liberal governance, um, uh, which was thought to be, in light of the democratic peace theory, a very good thing, right? Because the more you move towards liberal governance, the hopefully the more you become um, uh, much more willing uh, to push aside conflicts and wars and, and so on. Democratic peace theory really argues that the increasing number of democratic <coughs> states would lead eventually to a peaceful world because democracies don't go to war with each other. That's the, the mantra of democratic peace theory. I think it would be difficult to dispute the fact that uh, democracy has become universally accepted as a core value of the international system, particularly since the UN Charter was written. And I say this because um, we go back to, the, again, the Atlantic Charter, the, 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 the UN Charter, and uh, the push for, um, for giving individuals rights, um, to forgiving uh, all people rights, and I think that that was commonly accepted as being the way in which international communities should progress. But as recently as the late 1970s, uh, there were only about 40 countries whose governments could be considered to be democratic. Uh, and this situation changed at the end of the Cold War uh, when the globe witnessed an exponential shift towards democratic governance. In fact, in the formal sense of civilian constitutional multi-party <coughs> regimes, um, there was a gentleman by the name of Larry Diamond, who some of you might know, wrote back in 1995 that there are more democracies in the world today, that was 1995, than ever before. In the final two decades of the last century, uh, efforts to promote democracy and good governance uh, became globally accelerated and became significantly uh, a, a trend uh, moving towards that uh, in, in the, at the end of the, 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 the last century. And some people refer to this as the third wave. Over 120 th countries representing roughly two-thirds of the global population uh, are now engaged in democracy of some sort, process of building uh, democratic governance. And the United Nations system, and I'm glad that Amina 
Mohammed was here today because she can, she can tell you a lot more about this than I can. But the United Nations system has been at the center of this activity for very obvious reasons. Remember, for those of you who were here on the first day, I talked about the, the fact that there is a conceptualization of the of world order that can be sort of um, uh, seen as like a triangle uh, where ideas and material capabilities and institutions become the sort of the structure, the fundamental structure of world order. Well, one of the ideas that were embedded are some of the ideas that were embedded within the United Nations Charter at the, at the creation of this new world order since 1945 was in fact liberal democracy, right? And, uh, and even although uh, many countries were not, that were members of the United Nations were not necessarily democracies at the time, there was a, a sense that they would move cl uh, closer and closer to democratic governance over time. Now, what has happened is that today now we've seen a, a regression, a movement away, in fact, from the democratic uh, um, governance. <coughs> and uh, some people call it hybrid governance, right? Um, I like to call it the movement towards illiberal governance, right? These are, govern these are governance, th this is a governance structure that's illiber illiberal and actually critical of liberal democratic pr practices. And I want to talk a little bit about this because I remember Fariz Zakaria, and you would know him from CNN. Two decades ago, he was talking about uh, the rise of illiberal democracies. Remember that article, right? It was a very, very pivotal article. In fact, I would say it was a very prophetic article because up to that point, there wasn't a lot of evidence for what he was saying. But uh, from then on, we started to see the evidence of what he was referring to. He was really talking about the rise of popular autocrats. Um, who have little regards for the rule of law and little regards for civil liberties. And sure, some of these uh, leaders were elected. You can't say that they were not elected. Hitler was elected, but then look and see what happened. So some of these leaders were elected, and, uh, but then, uh, and, and in fair, fair and free elections too. But once they were in office, they tended to violate some of the basic principles of liberal democracies, the basic rights of their own citizens. In some sense, Zakaria was prophetic in that he <coughs> sort of referred to a situation that occurred a little bit later after he published that, that, uh, that piece. Um, today, there are illiberal democracies on the rise and have become, it now has become almost like the norm to expect uh, liberal democracies to be in place. So while democracies are on the rise, uh, since, I would say since the 2000, in the 2000, early 2000s until the present, a good thing for us to remember is that many of them are so-called liberal democracies. And I think, I guess, to, to, to your point you just made just now about the fact that they, they're not really democracies. They, they, they sort of take on some of the elements of democracies, right? They have elections. Uh, they have some of the things that we expect democracies to have, but they're not truly at the base democracies. And um, I think um, there was a resolution passed in the United Nations General Assembly in the year 2000, Resolution 55-2, if you ever get a chance to take a look at that. And you'll see how the UN tried to encourage uh, or to build support for some of these fledgling democracies, right? Uh, they created a, a democratic uh, institution within the organization, within the United Nations system, that would support, for example, electoral processes. Some of these countries didn't even know how to run an election properly. So um, the United Nations was supporting many of these emerging democracies as much as they possibly can through that resolution. Um, one of the things about democracies is that their populations are supposed to uh, keep their leaders in check. They're supposed to uh, embrace the liberal tenets that are embedded within the UN Charter. Um, they're supposed to embrace the norms of liberalism, if you will, um, in their own domestic constitutions and their own political practices domestically. But many of these democracies are failing to do so. Many of them are failing to provide equal protection, for example, of individual rights. Um, usually, the targets are minority groups, um, whether it be ethnic groups, uh, religious minorities, linguistic minorities, 
uh, regional minorities, LGBT, LGBT groups, um, gender in individuals, and uh, opposition groups especially. They tend to bear the brunt of illiberal policies of these emerging governance structures. Now, some of them face censorship. Some of these individuals face uh, persecution. Some of them face imprisonment. And some of them even face death as a result of their own governments. Now, liberal democratic values are firmly <coughs> based on rights. The right to have property and own property. The right to economic and social um, livelihood. The right to politics, the political rights, for example, the civil rights. Think about those uh, whose rights, civil rights, for example, are being affected today by some of these illiberal governments. Uh, think about the Kurds in Turkey. Think about the Roma in Hungary. Think about the liberals in, in Russia. I think about the uh, indigenous populations of Mexico and Rohingyas in Myanmar. Um, the asymmetry among the various claimants of, of different types of rights is very apparent. Um, elites have one set of rights, and the masses have another set of rights in many of those cases. And I think the dispossessed minorities that usually have very little say in the decision making of these governments, especially during the transition towards democracies, has been part of the problem. So the, the bulk of the people who should have had a say in creating their own democracies, that's what democracies are supposed to be all about, uh, didn't have a say. And as a result, you have a certain set of elites uh, that create what they consider to be a democratic state that's really not a truly democratic state. Now, in liberal democracies, there is usually a bargain, a bargain between the elites and the masses. Uh, and and which has a, this has a, cult, a, a bargain that has a sort of a, um, a culture of tolerance, a culture of, of tolerance for civil liberties, a culture, a culture of tolerance for equality among the peoples, the various peoples within the society. Um, that came crashing down with one speech written by, or said by Viktor Orban, it's something you might know Viktor Orban, the Hungarian prime minister, I think that's a pivotal moment. Many people thought, point to 1989 as being a pivotal moment and, and the year 2000 being a pivotal moment. I think 2014 was a pivotal moment for democratic governance and what we call liberal democratic governance. Because Viktor Orban, Hungarian, Hungarian prime minister, his speech was the epitome of a liberal democracy. He pushed for an alternative to liberalism all the things that we expected to, to find in a liberal democratic state, he pushed against. He was critical of NGOs, extremely critical of NGOs. He was critical of human rights groups, right? He called them human rights warriors. And he was critical of anything that was Western democratic. So, and he pushed for uh, a non-Western, what do you call it, Eastern approach to democracy based on the strong state, this notion of a strong state, the strong man. And in the process, what he was really pushing for was a weak opposition to him and the emaciation of checks and balances. Um, and what, he saw was, what we saw was individual freedom being uh, pushed back as a result of this kind of, um, uh, this, this kind of thinking. Because he saw individual freedom basically as as an intellectual impediment uh, for his plans in Hungary. He was also critical of European integration, which in, in fact embodies some of the basic principles of, of democratic governance as well, of liberal democratic governance, as to say. He was clearly supportive of governance that, considered, that could be considered uh, dictatorships. Um, he, for example, was firmly embracing China as being uh, uh, a, a kind of an admired governance structure, as far as he was concerned. And he embraced quasi-democratic illiberal states like Tur Turkey and Singapore. Uh, he dismissed values of pluralism. Uh, and he, he felt that they, they, those values that, we normally enshrined, that were normally enshrined in liberal democratic practice were not for him, not for Hungary. And, uh, this form of 
illiberal governance itself is intolerant or was intolerant towards minority groups um, and really was at the base of it, I call it xeno-racist. Um, not xenophobic, but xeno-racist in the sense that it really was a pushback against my, um, uh, foreign groups coming into Hungary. And you'll find that many of the illiberal governance uh, structures are basically pushing back against minority groups. So refugees, we talked about refugees and the importance of that subject matter for us today. Uh, refugees are being um, targeted by some of, the, some of these illiberal governance uh, groups. Um, so basically what we've seen is a complete wholesale rejection of liberal values that were embedded within the UN Charter. And it really shows us that the liberal world order is under attack today. And unfortunately, the alternative forms of governance that are coming up and emerging, many of them, we call it hybrid is probably the best way to put it, but many of these alternative forms of governance um, are really taking us back, way back into a time when autocratic regimes uh, were primary, were, were primary, were dominant, I should say. Um, so I will leave it there because I, I think that's sufficient provocation for you uh, to think about this subject. And I give you, I gave you some a little bit of a historical context in, in terms of how this thing has developed. Uh, but certainly, it's something that we should be very concerned about. Anyone who believes in the liberal, liberal democratic values of the United Nations system should be very concerned about about this trend. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank, thank you everyone um, uh, for all your insightful points on the rise of alternative forms of governments. Um, I would now like to um, give the panelists a chance to ask each other questions. And um, it, while, I guess while you're thinking of questions, I, can, I have one of my own for all of you. Um, so in Epic, um, one of the books we read was um, Edward Luce's, um, he, he just published it, um, The Retreat of Western Liberalism. And in it, he argues um, that at the crux of um, Western liberalism's crisis is that our societies are split between the will of the people and the rule of the experts, the tyranny of the majority versus the club of self-serving insiders, Britain versus Brussels, West Virginia versus Washington. Ultimately, Western populism is an illiberal democratic response to undemocratic liberalism. Um, it's a pretty provocative statement, but I don't, if, do you have any thoughts on this, um, whether you agree with it or not? If I may. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, democracy in its Western understanding, uh, which has uh, developed uh, after the Second World War, uh, has developed together with the social group which backgrounded democracy in its Western understanding, and its middle class. Middle class. And middle class in uh, many Western democracies, and not Western, but in many democracies, and including this state, is transforming. Is tra transforming to, to something else. On the one hand, it is dividing inside into uh, very separated groups of upper middle class and others, and, uh, and lower middle class. And on the same side, uh, on, on the other hand, it's eroding and uh, it is uh, separating into um, social groups which are becoming encapsulated uh, social uh, uh, you know, char uh, uh, stratas, uh, which sometimes are uh, reminding castas even, uh, if we will compare it to uh, Indian system. But uh, the key question is, uh, to which extent uh, this you know, middle class in Western democracy uh, could uh, and uh, can become uh, the background uh, for liberal democracy in the future? And to which extent the developing, the growing middle class in uh, non-Western societies, including China, Russia, Brazil, uh, India, and many others, will uh, uh, try to gain democracy maybe in, 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 in not in its uh, Western understanding and liberal Western model, but in some understanding, to gain democracy as, the, as an instrument for their political power. To me, for me, both of these questions are critical for analyzing the future society and uh, you know, uh, also future international systems. 
because uh, middle class as a driver of the political system, as a, a, as a, a social group motivated mostly with economic interests and economic rationality, is always influencing on decision-making process and changing uh, foreign policy. Uh, so, so uh, this is something I um, care a lot about, and uh, from the standpoint of the foreign policy establishment, I think needing to be um, more self-critical in the United States. Uh, and uh, so, so you know, what, what I, you know, I, I served the Obama administration, but I, fi I found it very disheartening that it was only in the eighth year of President Obama's tenure that he went to the UN General Assembly. And he said, globalization needs a course correction. Mm -hmm. Where have you been for eight years, right? I mean, that, that's how a lot of people felt in hearing that. Uh, and, and we now have you know, evidence by um, uh, economists like David Otter at MIT down the road here um, suggesting that uh, more than 2 million manufacturing and associated jobs in the United States were lost between the time that the United States granted permanent normal trade relations with China to China, um, uh, and um, something like 2010. Um, multiply that times the number of people that live in a household. Um, look at how concentrated um, some of those effects were in the United States. And then you have to, it really should be, a, then the puzzle to me is why, why, why have Americans <coughs> continued to support the project of internationalism? That's to me, in some senses, the more puzzling question. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of soul searching that needs to happen. Um, part of the problem is in the Congress, where uh, Congress does not necessarily represent a lot of these concerns, um, members of Congress that, uh, that Americans have had about the direction of American foreign policy. Uh, and then even within the, the uh, national security establishment, within the, within the executive, um, I think the national security uh, uh, council process has walled itself off from the domestic policy implications of what they do. So it's largely, um, you know, there, there's pride, in fact, in saying we don't, we don't talk about politics. And when they say that, they don't just mean how this decision will affect who wins the next election. They mean what the domestic uh, policy impact is going to be. And so all, all this adds up to the, uh, you know, going back to the post, you know, when this, when this post-war order was imagined and built, uh, it was founded on what you all have probably read about, the idea of embedded liberalism, but basically it's a political economic bargain, saying we will engage with the world, we'll, we'll become more open, but in turn we'll make sure that dislocation is addressed by domestic policy. Uh, and that didn't happen. It certainly didn't happen in the aftermath of uh, the, the job losses from uh, China's accession to the WTO. And, and in fact, if you go back and look at what President Clinton said when he lobbied the Congress for that, he said, this will be a hundred to nothing deal for America. We'll export goods and no jobs. Um, that was a commitment made. And you wonder why people then became skeptical of NAFTA. So this is not all to say that we, I, I don't think we should oppose trade. I think the decision on tariffs that made this past week was actually a bad one. Uh, but you have to acknowledge that we haven't offset the effects of this through domestic policy, and the national security establishment has been reluctant to wade into that because that's seen to them as political. I always forget it's on. Um, so, yeah. Um, I, I agree with uh, Fyodor, I, and I agree with Tarun. Um, I think... Um, I think the, the main drivers of the rise of illiberalism and the rise of populism um, is socioeconomic. Uh, and it is uh, the pain of the middle class or the decline of the middle class or people falling out of the middle class. Um, and I will venture to say that um, in all of our countries represented here, uh, East and West, um, those like the United States or Western Europe that have been living under um, the um, system of um, liberal system of political democracy and market economy for the past hundred years, and those of us who um, have been struggling to um, regain our freedom to choose our political systems and choose democracy. Um, the past hundred years um, 
in the past 100 years, it is the generation, the current generation, that has experienced something that no generation had experienced before. Um, they're not better off than their parents were. Um, they're worse off. Uh, youth unemployment is high. Um, unemployment in general uh, is high. We, all of us here, experienced 10 years ago uh, the biggest global economic crisis of several generations since the Great Depression. Um, all those expectations and promises that were passed on from generations to generation. Uh, if, if there's those of you, if, if there's a few of you in the audience who like Billy Joel, he has that um, great song, Allentown, about the breakdown of industry in, in America. Um, and that's what he says, you know. The kids were always told that they would live better, they would be better off, they would live a better life than their fathers. That hasn't been true for a while. And that hasn't been true since um, the era of globalization. And, and that leads to my second point on this, is a very, very great responsibility of the post-Cold War elite um, mismanaging globalization. Because if I go back to the, my original point, the whole euphoria of the year of mir miracles um, in 1989, the whole idea was now that you know, communism is over, great power competition is over, we can just focus on all getting rich and um, getting prosperous and um, lift, up the middle, lift up the poor um, to the middle class, strengthen the middle class. That hasn't happened. Globalization has been much more complicated. It has had a lot of winners, but it has had many more losers. And I think that has, has driven. So I think it's socioeconomic, but it's also a mismanagement <coughs> on the part of the elite. And I don't think the elite has been called to account um, for how they've mismanaged the past 30 years. Um, that moment, that moment of euphoria was a great opportunity to remake the world. Uh, and I go back to you know, some of your points, Fyodor. Uh, we, we haven't remade the world. Uh, globalization just kind of came and brought good things and destroyed a lot of other things. And, um, and you know, this is, I think, where we need to think. And obviously, great powers like the US and Russia and China have um, greatest responsibility. But the operators of the liberal world order on the Western side have even bigger responsibility than those who are not operators, no, 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 not leaders. And I think what, what we need is to give back, um, I, I, you know, just you know, from, from our specific example in Hungary, I know my generation, the people um, eh, who are younger than me, we've had it worse of all the generations, every generation since World War II. World War II generation obviously was, was hurt, really damaged, decimated. Um, but every generation since has improved on um, their livelihood, their standard of living. This is the first, genera first generation that didn't especially disappointed um, everyone uh, in, in the West, and we see that elsewhere too, because the promise of 1989 was that this is the age of building. This is the age of prosperity. Now we can focus, we don't have to deal with great power competition, there will be no world wars, uh, the whole uh, nuclear annihilation, the, you know, the mutual, mutually assured destruction, all of that is over. We can just focus on globalization and, and prosperity and do that through the globalized world economy um, with the participation of Russia and China and all those who were excluded from it. That hasn't happened because that's not how easy it is. Um, it needs to be managed. It needs to be, it needs to be regulated. We need the international organizations, and we need again the great powers who are, you know, respond, who who have greater responsibility. I, if I can add just a few other points, because I, I think you've covered quite a bit um, in terms of the response to to the question uh, that Brendan posed for us. Uh, but I have to say that we were kind of sold um, a bill of goods uh, with the whole liberal democracy, democracy project, okay? Um, that, first of all, we were told almost that there was no other alternative to globalization. 
people believe that if you, ha if you move towards these liberal democratic kind of governance structures, uh, you also have to embrace globaliz globalization and that there was no alternative to globalization, but we found out that there, there are alternatives to globalization, that globalization itself uh, is like a two-edged sword. Um, it's brought great wealth to a very small percentage of the population and, and, and massive poverty to a lot of people. Uh, so, so I think that's one of the things that we have to remember uh, and, and understand why people are moving away from this so-called, you know, this so-called stereotype of a liberal democratic governance structure is that many people are falling between the cracks yes. because of globalization. And they can't seem to be able to, to, to marry that, what's, what's happening to them, with the, with the kind of political democratic system uh, that they had embraced. And this will explain, for example, why many people in, in middle income uh, parts of the United States start to reject uh, the liberal democracies as well, um, or the whole, the whole practice of liberal democracy. And I think many people in the third world, and I, I, I come from a, a sort of a third world perspective in some ways, having been born in a third world country, but then moved to Canada uh, as a teenager. But I still have a very, very much a, a subaltern, I would say, perspective on the world. And there is something called global apartheid. There is something called, um, uh, uh, we have to go back to Marxism. I know a lot of people think that Marxism is dead, but there, there are elements of Marxism that's very, very important yes. for understanding how the real, the real world works. Um, I remember um, Wallerstein and, uh, and the dependency theorists have brought this to our attention many years ago. And we've kind of forgotten about that in our, in our education about how the world really works. But there is a core, there is a semi-periphery and there's a periphery. And a lot of people on the periphery never get to see what or benefit from what the core does. And, and this is not just in terms of the global perspective, it also happens within countries like the United States. There is a periphery in the United States too that are not benefiting uh, uh, by globalization. I think we have to bear that in mind. I think this is one of the reasons why people are rejecting the so-called liberal world order. And um, if we're going to ever move back to that, then we have to deal with questions of injustices and inequalities. And it's time for us to start to think about how we're going to address those two elements, injustices and inequalities. And I think once we get over that hump, then maybe we can start to move back towards some of the basic principles that the United Nations uh, tried to advocate in 1945. Um, and I, I like what, uh, Peter, what you said about the fact that the Atlantic Charter was not just signed by Western powers, that uh, the Russians also signed, the Soviet Union also signed uh, that charter. And uh, the United Nations Human Rights um, uh, Declaration wasn't just signed by Western powers either. I remember it, there was a conference to Tehran where many of the principles of the Human Rights de Declaration was also um, was also proposed and signed by people on the East. So there has to be a merging of East and West, and we have to find new forms of governance, and it may not necessarily look like the ones that we've seen from 1945 to the present. And I think that's, that's, that basic understanding uh, will help us to, to, to lead to a transitional form of governance that could be better than we had before. That's my hope. Thank you. Um, do the panelists have any questions for each other, or should um, we move on to Q&A? Okay, all right. Well, um, so we're opening up to questions to the audience. Um, there are microphones in each aisle. Um, we ask that you um, line up behind those and identify yourself. And in the interest of having as many questions as possible, please limit um, one question to one panelist. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Julia. I'm from the Brazilian delegation, and my question is to Dr. Wojtolowski. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you said that you believe that nuclear weapons keep our international system stable because they keep us cautious. Um, coming from a non-nuclear state, I do believe that they keep us cautious because they keep us afraid. And I also do believe that they, that um, stability presumes uh, rational international actors. And based on what we discussed until here, I do believe that we have had a rise of, like Dr. Knight said, illiberal democracies 
and countries which are not necessarily able to keep their governments, to keep check of their governments. And so my question to you is, in that system of stability based on nuclear weapons, how do you deal with uh, irrational actors that won't necessarily refrain from using their nuclear weapons? Great. Really great question. And, you know, for decades, nuclear weapons, uh, w w they were one of significant elements of sustainability of relations between major powers, between uh, especially the United States and Soviet Union, then the United States and Russia, but also among uh, all uh, permanent members of UN Security Council. And that kept uh, the system stable. And I think that if uh, uh, nuclear weapons didn't exist, for example, we could have a uh, uh, military conflict not only among major powers, but, uh, for example, uh, between India and Pakistan. And, uh, but uh, during all this period, uh, these major powers, these you know, stakeholders of nuclear uh, camp uh, were trying to keep their privilege and were trying to keep their priority in uh, having uh, uh, and uh, using the nuclear weapons. And uh, to my mind, uh, it's, it's an ambivalent thing. Sometimes, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, rational motivation is uh, uh, driving uh, countries like uh, Iran or North Korea to uh, obtain nuclear weapons. They, 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 want to, they want to survive. But uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, the level of unpredictability of behavior of some actors which are trying to obtain nuclear weapons is becoming a matter of concern of, uh, you know, responsible uh, members of the international community. Nuclear weapons are significant because they are developing a, uh, responsibility. Because if you have them, you need to be integrated into this, you know, club and to live on the rules, under the rules of this club. And if somebody is trying to, to join the club, it, it, it's a, it, it's a, uh, you know, it is challenging all members of the club. And it is challenging the, the, the international order. You, you may like it or not, but existing in this hierarchical model. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a question uh, which is, you know, to my mind, uh, will be one of the most significant for the development of the system of arms control and international security in the future. Who we will let to join the club and who will not? And uh, uh, will the nuclear uh, weapons uh, become uh, the ticket to some club or even to a ticket for, uh, you know, surviving for some states or not? That's my answer. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Sarah from Singapore. Um, my question is a combination of the previous panel on nationalism and populism, as well as what has been mentioned in this panel. Um, so much has been said about hybrid regimes or regimes um, <coughs> in, in terms of, say, so-called democracies, um, where there are um, so-called free and fair elections, but the party in power or the individual in power often uses means such as um, the media constraints on finances to clamp down on the opposition. And this is obviously anti-liberal. Um, on the other hand, however, what if these parties um, that are gaining grounds as the opposition are in fact populist and are nationalist? And when they are being voted into power, they will necessarily bring about more illiberal policies. And in this situation, um, whether or not the current party clamps down on them or whether or not the new illiberal party rises up, both situations are illiberal. So how would you reconcile that? Thank you. In these hybrid regimes um, or illiberal states, um, it really is not a competition between illiber illiberal parties, I would say, I would argue. Um, I think it is a very asymmet asymmetric, asymmetric competition um, struggle between a group 
that holds monopoly on power through, as you said, um, different techniques. Again, a lot of these countries have constitutional systems, parliamentary systems, quasi-representative systems. They have elections in the sense of the word that we have gotten to, to look at elections in Western liberal <coughs> democracies. The, all the theatrics are there, but there is no chance for the opposition to get into power. And the opposition parties, they want, um, they want change, they want pluralism. I mean, this is the, you know, if you look at the, uh, the parties in, in Turkey, uh, JHP, the uh, Republican um, Party, uh, Atatürk's party, um, MHP, um, although MHP has, uh, the Nationalist Party has uh, cooperated with Erdogan um, in forming coalitions. The Kurdish Party, um, some of which, some of whose lawmakers have been, um, you know, banned from parliament, imprisoned. We had just a week ago um, here uh, Aykan Erdemir, who was uh, a JHP parliamentarian. He was a member of uh, Turkish parliament. He was my friend in Ankara when I was uh, serving there. And, um, and he's here, he's in DC um, at one of the uh, uh, think tanks because he has to be here. His assets were seized by the regime and uh, there's an uh, arrest warrant um, for him in Turkey. He can't go back. Um, they want pluralism, uh, these parties, but they, they have no chances because, again, the theatrics of democracy are there, but there's no chance of, um, obviously. I don't mean that there's never going to be a chance in Hungary or Poland or Turkey, any of these hybrid gray zone systems to change government. In fact, we have elections in Hungary in a month on April 8th, and opposition could win, but the, the odds are against them. Everything is stacked against them. All the rules, all the circumstances, media, um, the laws, um, the election system itself is geared uh, towards a victory by the in-group. This is, this is the problem. So I'm not so worried, um, Sarah, that um, you know, if there, a new party comes into power, they will do the same. Um, because I think there, is, there are movements in these countries that want that pluralism that they had before back. I'm not saying Turkish democracy prior to Erdogan's coming into power in 2002, 2003 was a, a perfect democracy. Atatürk's system was <coughs> deeply flawed, but it was pluralist. And so was pre-2010 uh, pre Hungary, pre-2015 Poland, um, and pre-2000 uh, Russia, even with some limitations. Um, I, I hope that answers your question. I, I'm, I'm, I'm much more hopeful that alternative parties will um, recreate pluralism if they, by the, by the movement of the people, get into power. Sorry, I was long-winded. Hi, my name is Kai. I'm a senior at Tufts University. Uh, my question is for Mr. Chaba. Mr. Chaba, you talked a little bit about the insularity of the American foreign policy and national security establishments. Um, I can only speak from my own experience, but I think a great example is when the United States pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It appeared to me a lot of this sort of the discussions that I heard um, were centered more around in Washington. A lot of the discussions were centered around um, not if, but when the United States would return back into the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And I was surprised at how little uh, discussion I heard about, well, what are, the, what are the real sort of underlying causes? Why do you think the discourse surrounding um, the policy that's often implemented by the the American national security and foreign policy establishments. Why is the discourse sur surrounding that so insular sometimes? And what can we do to mitigate that? Is this, a, is this a sort of a fundamental philosophical problem? Is it a policy problem? Or is it just a communications problem? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, great question. And um, just very quickly, on, I just want to say on the, on the nuclear question, um, you know, I, I think what 
we should all be very worried about now is nuclear doctrine in the hands of rational actors in particular. And we've just seen that, you know, the United States has just released a new nuclear posture review, which arguably in response to a new Russian doctrine, which could be perceived or real, we don't, you know, we don't know, um, uh, publicly, uh, which is lowering the threshold for nuclear use, right? So, so threatening the use of low yield nuclear weapons at lower levels of conflict in order to deter the United States. And so now in response, the United States has said, we will also um, rejuvenate previously defunct programs with low yield nuclear weapons. So this brings the likelihood of nuclear war. And then, then you're into a debate about whether using low yield nuclear weapons is likely to escalate into big nuclear weapons or not. And so that's something that we all should be very worried about. Uh, uh, and uh, so, so just quick, uh, to, your, to your really great question, um, I uh, I think that part of it is tra you know part of it is the way that we think about this. So we're kind of uh, in the national security establishment as we think about a quote unquote national interest, right? Well, you know who does the national interest serve in the United States, right? Well, we could, there are lots of ways questions in which we can think about a national interest in which we could probably all agree. But there are distributional impacts, especially when it comes to trade agreements. There are probably also distributional impacts that we don't look carefully at when it comes to who benefits most from the defense budget, for example. Right? Um, we could we could we could we could unroll a lot of foreign policy and national security related questions and look at those impacts. But we have an unwillingness, I think, to recognize that you can't be against protectionism and against redistribution. We want to we want we have a lot of people want to be against both. And the answer, you know, for a lot of folks, when they look at you know um, declining defense spending, is we need to cut entitlements, right? Uh, and and they don't think about necessarily whether that's going to jeopardize support, right, uh, for America's role in the world more broadly. So that's part of it is is the culture, and then there's also the as I mentioned the kind of idea of we want to insulate the national security decision making process from quote unquote politics, in order to kind of safeguard our legitimacy. People should know that we're not sullying national security decision making with dirty politics, right? Um, that's a sensibility that a lot of people come to the um, uh, decision making, to the situation room with. Um, and then there's just a structural way of how we organize it. So, you know, if you look back at the National Security Act of 1947 that established the, the NSC, there was a big debate about whether we should have domestic agencies involved, whether the Department of Agriculture, for example, should be involved in those decisions, and it was decided not. But there was a very, that was an open question, uh, and for a variety of detailed reasons that I won't get into here, um, there have been efforts to try to mitigate this problem, but they failed for a host of reasons. But I think if you went back, for example, to the Obama years and you asked whether the more progressive wing of the White House that was represented by the Domestic Policy Council really was heavily involved, I think, with TPP, for example, whether that was more run by the National Economic Council, which was more aligned with Wall Street, you'd probably find the latter uh, in that case. So I think there are things that we can try to do bureaucratically, but ultimately there, is a, there has to be a cultural shift, I think, in the way that we think about these problems. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Adar from the Israeli delegation. Um, one of the reasons for the rise of populism is the fact that it gives a very strong sense of identity, which in a way is a very emotional and even primal issue. And to my understanding, uh, the liberal world order is failing to offer anything that is even remotely close to it. So I would love to hear your take on this. Do you, do you want a specific panelist or? I'll say something, and uh, then yeah. you guys can join in. So, so Adele, uh, welcome. So it, it's so interesting you would ask that, because um, a couple of months ago, uh, the Center for Strategic Studies here uh, down the street uh, hosted um, Ehud Barak, uh, former uh, Prime Minister, and Dan Meridor, uh, former uh, minister and former Deputy Prime Minister, and um, it, without attribution, because it was a, it was a, a closed conversation, but I, I, I did a write-up of the conversation. It's very interesting that this is one of the things that they um, emphasized about Israel politics and about the left, especially, obviously, um, you know, one of the, one of the participants, um, that the left, and I agree, and, you know, 
Um, I'm going to take this as, you know, as it was their idea, but I, I identify with that. I think, you know, the left, the liberals, um, they also need to, you know, as against the populist. This, this is how I define the left now, not purely ideologically. Um, they need to, um, they, they need to understand what is driving uh, the identity um, politics of of um, of the of the populist of the usually right wing populist, uh, and we've seen that in all of those countries that uh, I was uh, mentioning earlier, and some of my colleagues were mentioning earlier. Uh, I think I think it is very important, and um, again, um, this is something I borrowed from uh, one of one of our Israeli speakers. Um, but it's interesting, it, uh, this question comes back from an Israeli participant, that uh, the left needs to identify with some of the, um, some of the values, I think this is, uh, this is the expression they use, some of the values that people um, have been holding dear for centuries. Um, I think uh, there needs to be a return to understanding wh why, um, why these things um, move people, why populists um, um, move people. And, you know, going back to my, my uh, f response to uh, a previous question, I, I really think that the Trump victory um, was long time coming um, because, because of both the socioeconomic <coughs> things, uh, socioeconomic factors that Fyodor and uh, Tarun um, and I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the crisis of the middle class, but also because people feel threatened in their core identities, national, religious, local, cultural, linguistic identities. I think it, it's very important for those who pose alternatives to the populists, to the liberals, um, to understand um, what drives the success of those. And I'm not saying they need to uh, use the same kind of uh, hate campaigns that we've seen in some of these illiberal states. But they also need to um, pick up some of the positive messages that the um, the populists are using. Thank you. Please. No, I don't know if you guys want to. Liam. Yeah. Hi, my name is Liam. I'm a member of the Epic Colloquium. First of all, um, thank you all for coming here this evening, um, this afternoon. We really do appreciate it. So I have a question directed toward Mr. Fahir. So in response to Brennan's question, you said that um, you're talking about the the post Cold War elite perspective, predominantly in the West of you know, now that the great ideological battle is over, we can all start focusing on you know getting rich, um, just building up. That was that was the promise of right 1989. Yeah. Yeah. So building up the poor and sort of safeguarding the the middle class. And I was yes. wondering if I could get your thoughts on sort of the inversion of that statement. So now that the great ideological battle is over, we can all start focusing on getting rich despite the middle class. In a sense, now that there's no alternative form of governance, we're no longer held to the same responsibility in safeguarding <coughs> the cohesion of this one. No, I th I, I think. Um, I, I might have uh, not made myself completely clear. So um, I, th I think some of the problems that we're facing today stem um, from the fact that back in the late 80s, early 90s, um, we welcomed the changes that were coming, the third wave of democratization and globalization, um, with such euphoria that we expected um, globalization and democratization to take care of everything. Um, including bringing up the middle class. But globalization has created its own winners and losers. And those losers have been speaking up uh, in the past couple of years. They've been speaking up in Hungary, they've been speaking up in Poland, in Turkey, they've been speaking up uh, in, um, among the supporters of um, Donald Trump. And uh, they spoke up uh, during uh, the Brexit vote in, in uh, Britain. That's, that was my point. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. My name is Serafim. I'm from the Haifa University, the Israeli delegation. And my question is mostly to Dr. Wojtalowski and uh, following up the proposition about the nuclear balance of power, power as an alternative form of world order. Well, following this notion of the balance of power or the, that Waltzian notion, um, one of the things that are considered the basic element of that order is that clear is a clear communi communication has been indicated in the Cuba crisis and all that stuff. Can it be really maintained in the current trend of falsification, disinformation, 
Great question. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we need to keep these uh, uh, channels for which states uh, which are possessing nuclear weapons are uh, communicating with, uh, with each other clear. We need confidence building measures, we need transparency. For example, the United States and Russia are the most transparent countries in the world in terms of their military planning, in terms of uh, their nuclear uh, strategy, in terms of their nuclear arsenals, because we are, uh, we are open to each other and it's one of elements of, uh, significant elements of our communication between each other. But, uh, for example, there are lots of countries in the world who are having nuclear weapons and not transparent in this way. It's understandable because uh, sometimes it's a question of their survival, like for Israel. And uh, sometimes it's a question of uh, uh, their spendings on nuclear weapons and of uh, their nuclear planning, uh, like in the case of China. But uh, if we will have transparency, if we will have confidence-building measures, not on bilateral level between Russia and the United States, and it's a great question if we will keep these uh, measures alive uh, during next decades between Russia and the United States. But if we will have it on more, you know, broad level uh, with uh, uh, engagement of uh, other uh, nuclear states, it, it will be more sustainable world order. Just to add, I mean, we, we now know from declassified archives how close we were to a nuclear encounter during the Cuban Missile Crisis. We yes. know how close we were to a lot of nuclear accidents throughout the Cold War because a bear jumped over a fence, you know, <clears> on, a, on, a, on an American base. So, so uh, you know, you've read the Scott Sagan-Waltz debate, you know Scott Sagan's work on the limits of safety. You know, now, now I, I think there's somebody working on an article now, that, imagine the Cuban Missile Crisis with Twitter. Right, uh, right now. Uh, how do, yeah, how do you feel? Yeah, that's, that's how we all feel, I think, about that. Uh. Right, uh, Vitaly Kozarev, I teach political science at Endicott College. Um, so my question is, uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the insightful uh, presentations, but uh, I think that we need to elaborate a little bit more on the uh, core subject of the contestation for liberal order, which is the so-called rules-based uh, order. So, what is the rules-based order in terms of, uh, in terms of, from the uh, non-Western perspective? So be, since we are speaking about alternative forms, since China, for example, Russia has been criticized in the United States and in the West for like violating or breaking up this rules-based order. So, how should we perceive the rules-based order uh, in term, and especially in the context that China and Russia claim that they are fighting for the rules-based order? So where's the, where's the truth, if you could elaborate on this? Maybe Mr. Chabra and Dr. Vatilovsky. Thank you. If, if. Well, again, I would just say, you know, I, I don't believe the argument that if there's a crime, there's no law, right? So, so again, we can have a rules-based order and we can see violations. We can say that we generally want to have democratic allies and then we can struggle with a lot of our allies, especially as we are right now. But, you know, when it comes to rules, I mean, I think we're generally talking about um, principles and rules enshrined in the UN do founding documents, which, which um, Dr. Knight talked about. We're talking about agreements that are made bilaterally. You know, in this case, we could talk about Ukraine and Russia, for example, and, and in that context, Crimea. Um, I think, I, 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 I don't think definitionally this is complicated. I, I am interested, though, you know, to hear, because I, I you know, from a Chinese and Russian perspective, um, you know, I think the sense is often that uh, those rules are just the wrong rules, right? So they're rules that facilitate American hegemony or they support American hegemony at the expense of Russia and China. Now, you hear that less from China, given that the, that the, the order has really facilitated enormous growth in, in China, and they will sit, you know, the, their challenge to order in East Asia is very different from what you see generally elsewhere in the world, at least for now. Um, but the Russian posture on this, just to be honest, is I, I'm really eager. I'd love to hear Fyodor's. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think there is always, you know, uh, uh, idea. There is always law, like expression of idea, uh, which aim to be regulate relations, and their reality. 
the reality of international relations. And uh, you know, sometimes they differ very much. For example, uh, you know, uh, violation of uh, UN Charter, violation of uh, uh, UN Security Council resolution, uh, resolutions happened many times after the end of the Cold War. We can uh, name uh, bombing of Yugoslavia, we can name uh, uh, operation in Iraq, uh, we can name uh, a situation with Libya when, uh, you know, uh, there was uh, a decision to, b to block uh, uh, the skies, but no decision for military operation. But uh, there is also Crimea, which, which is also going out of uh, principles of, uh, um, you know, uh, international law in their uh, understanding uh, which, uh, uh, you know, countries uh, uh, tried to develop uh, after the end of the Cold War. But uh, uh, to my mind, we need to uh, develop behavior of, uh, you know, major players, of major stakeholders uh, of the international system in the way which could give, uh, you know, uh, all of them uh, equal rights and equal responsibility and uh, equal capability to sustain this system and to understand themselves as stakeholders of this system. If uh, somebody is trying to be the major st stakeholder, it, it, it's always influencing uh, on uh, the rights and uh, you know, uh, opportunities of others. So uh, the balance is somewhere here. Let me say something to this really quickly, very interesting um, remarks. Um, I think what is happening now, and th this is a great question about, you know, who is within the rules, right? Um, I think what is happening now is what, you know, um, some of the panels um, have discussed today is there's a new situation. Um, there is a um, m new international um, configuration, we are no longer in a unipolar moment. So Russia and China and some others are demanding their, um, their seat at the table. And um, those rising powers um, who were not at the rulemaking table, um, they don't feel that they need to necessarily um, stay within uh, the rules that um, they were not part of making. That said, I want to distinguish between Russia and China. Um, to me, Ch uh, Russia's behavior in the past um, 70 years um, with um, its, its much more assertive um, foreign policy or global policy, the interventions um, um, in um, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, um, Crimea, Eastern Ukraine, Syria, and um, Russian activity um, meddling in so many countries' internal affairs, culminating in the interference in the 2016 U.S. elections. I feel that Russia, even though they pay lip service to, um, you know, international law and international rules, I think they are attacking the current international order. Whereas my f um, sense of Xi Jinping's strategy in the past couple of years is now that China is almost as um, big economically as the United States, they want in, they want to be integrated at the top of the international order. And that was reflected in uh, Xi Jinping's uh, speech in Davos in a year and a half ago, which sounded like a speech that the U.S. president should have given. And Xi Jinping kind of claims the international economic order and demands, you know, China's place uh, at the helm. So um, very different strategies, I think. Um, but I think what uh, Fyodor said, and, and I think uh, Tarun um, also alluded to that earlier, I think the U.S. needs to be an exemplar um, of upholding the rules of the international order that it, uh, led, um, it, it created or it led the creation of. Uh, can I react uh, just yes. quickly uh, to Zoltan's words about Russia? You know, uh, uh, for many years, uh, Russia uh, felt itself, and Russian uh, political elite felt itself excluded from uh, the 
uh, you know, emerging community of democracies from the Western uh, world, uh, and it looked forward to be engaged. And when we are analyzing, you know, steps which are, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, which are understanding, uh, which are understood uh, in uh, the West as, uh, you know, uh, some challenging the international system, challenging the liberal world order. We should uh, uh, pay attention to uh, this, you know, feeling of exclusion of, uh, from the international system, exclusion from the hierarchy of this, this international system of the, after the end of the Cold War. And concerning China, um, I hope that China is looking forward to be integrated, but uh, let, let's ask our Vietnamese friends about it. What, what do they think about it? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, honorable panelists, and uh, very uh, enlightening conversation. Uh, I think my question is kind of connected with the previous one, and uh, I come from China as a so-called challenger of the current liberal world order country, <laughs> and uh, I feel really doubtful about like the superiority um, or the legitimacy of the Western liberal world order, because my impression is that the world order or the rule is always written by the most powerful country, and it has all its resources, both military resources, economic resources, to safeguard and uh, to legitimize it, the order it has established. And also, like the, the currently, the media is mostly dominated by the Western media, and uh, the West has dominated the, the discourse, uh, the power discourse. And uh, as a result, um, I think the pe people across the world, uh, they, their, their mind are shaped like the, the Western world order is a, a widely um, accepted one. But, um, and uh, so as a consequent, um, however, on the other hand, we see that as a humankind, no matter the East or the West, we share a lot of common values. Uh, like Professor Knight has mentioned, uh, what has been written in the UN Charter, like the, the freedom, equality, the human, uh, the right of the people. Actually, these values are also attached to great importance in China, and maybe also in the countries who are also called uh, like the challengers of the current world order. And f I come from China, and I know that this kind of values is written in the constitution of Chinese Pe uh, People's Republic of China. But these voices are rarely heard in, in the West. So I guess like a lot of our values are not mutually uh, exclusive. Actually, they can coexist. So my question, I guess, uh, we are all the young, well, young gener people, we are the future global leaders. What can we do to get rid of this like cold, cold wall mentality, po power politics, zero-sum game, and to find some common grounds um, towards like a, a common human values? Or do you think it is not possible? <laughs> That's my question. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it's one million dollar question. Uh, uh, I think that uh, the only source uh, towards you know stability, towards international system develops, uh, the, the, the developing under the principles of rule of law, international institutions, and uh, everything like that, uh, is uh, you know uh, understanding of common interests in economy, in the sphere of security. And if we are understanding that we have common challenges in the sphere of security and we have common threats, it will drive us uh, to, to, to get closer to each other. Because every time we are, we are facing international terrorism, Islamist radicalism, uh, we are facing you know, uh, far-right radicalism, we are understanding, uh, or nationalism, we are understanding that there are factors which are very different from our political narratives, from our interests, and which are dangerous for all of us. So since we will take into account different challenges, threats, uh, coming from different you know, spheres of transnational life, of uh, uh, international life, uh, uh, we will get closer to the more peaceful and stable world. Um. Just uh, very, very quickly, I'll Not just say something uh, after you. Yeah, sure. So I, I think it's wonderful that there are Chinese students here, Russian students here. Something that worries me is that as 
we have we, we see more competition between the United States and Russia and China, these kinds of dialogues are going to be more difficult. We're already seeing it with visa restrictions, for example. I mean, I have colleagues <coughs> who, if they're critical of China, are not allowed to go to China. And sometimes that's used punitively for young academics, for example, who won't get tenure because they can't do their research in China. And so I think that's a very dangerous thing, and we need to try to keep these channels open. Yeah. On the other hand, I'll say I don't think we benefit if we paper over differences. I think that's dangerous because I think it leads us into confrontation at times that's not well understood. It's, we are better off understanding where we have divergent values. And I think the reality is we do. Um, uh, the, I think it, in China there is more emphasis put on uh, economic rights, for example, than there are on civil and political rights. And I think it's okay for us to talk about that to debate that, and we could be criticized for the inverse, right, uh, in the United States and much of the West. Uh, but those are discussions that we ought to have and come to a better understanding over what our red lines are, where we are likely to escalate into crises, into conflict, uh, in order to avoid them rather than papering over them. Absolutely. Okay, I'll, I'll be the bad cop here. I think it's power politics. I think it's power politics. I think China and, and, and Russia are fighting their, um, fighting for their uh, seat at the table, and I think they're they're getting there. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't talk. We shouldn't cooperate. Um, Fyodor started with the Atlantic Charter. There's your example. Um, we together defeated the the, the devil in in 1945, um, and that's a legacy that you know that kind of obliges us. Um, to continue cooperating. And I don't think any of us, any of the people in the American um, or Russian or European national security or foreign policy establishment, for example, want to see um, war between uh, the US and China. Um, but it's a distinct possibility if we don't talk and if we miscalculate. Um, so I agree. I agree with, with um, both of your suggestions that we need to um, need to continue uh, dialogue without restrictions um, and I think we're, we're heading there but again I think going back to Waltz someone brought up Waltz and balance of power I think a lot of it is a lot of the seats at the table are fought um, through power politics um, and I think it's good that those who deserve to be there because they're important powers great powers should be at the at the table, because if they're not at the table, we can't talk to them. Um, so unfortunately, we are running out of time. We do have the breakouts, at, um, which we're, are supposed to be starting around now. But um, I think we um, do have time for one more question. Um, over there. Um, hello, I'm a, my name's Alex. I'm a senior mechanical engineer, so I apologize for any ignorance in my question. Um, but my question, following along the same vein, is how does one enforce world laws, especially to those who have a lot of power on the world stage, like the US, China, Russia. Um, as an example, Dr. Wojcikowski, you said how China signed on to the law of the seas and the US helped write it, but isn't signed on. Um, and then a few years ago, they, the world court said they could no longer build barrier reefs and had to, in their dispute with the Philippines, so, but nothing came of that. There was no enforcement. So how does one enforce those laws? And if they're not enforced, then what's the use of them in, in the first place? I, th I think you know the post 1945 um, system has been the superpowers and the great powers enforce laws. Um, the UN doesn't have en enforcement mechanisms unless the Security Council um, agrees on uh, some mechanisms, sanctions, um, and so on. So. That there, there is, uh, you know, only one possibility for, uh, you know, development and enforcement of international law. If uh, the major stakeholders of the international system uh, agree on something, it can result to some practical thing. For example, uh, non-proliferation regime. You know, er all responsible uh, countries and the uh, major powers or uh, agree with each other on the necessity of non-proliferation regime. And it works. You know, m good or bad, but it, it works, it, it exists. The UNCLOS, the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, is then an opposite example. Russia is ready, the United States are not ready, China is ready, but partly ready, 
already when it, when it is interesting to China uh, or ready to do something in another way when it is interesting to China. So when we will have uh, major powers uh, sitting at the table, which is Alton mentioned, and uh, agree uh, on something and having common interests, this system could work. In other case, th there will be no international law. Thank you. Well, I think that is our, all the time we have. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, just before you go, I'd like to make an announcement. At, right now, um, right after this, we have expert-led small group uh, breakout sessions. Um, you can get um, this paper that says all of um, the titles of them and where they will be held. I'm going to read them out off for you, but you can get them outside the auditorium. It's, um, number one, the Indian subcontinent and the liberal world order um, will be in Mugar Hall, a room 200, religion, an ally or an opponent of the liberal world order will be in Olin Hall. Um, energy, security, and technology in developing countries will be in Cabot Hall, room 205. Russia and U.S. relations in Olin Hall. Um, the Arctic Circle, climate change and geopolitics in Cabot Hall, room 206. And the future of R R2P in Olin Hall, room 116. Um, and let's just thank our panelists one more time for a great panel. Yeah, the red discussion. That was that was fun. That was fun. Yeah, there will only be a few minutes. Uh, I'll be here.